Good morning, everyone. On behalf of St. Luke's United Church here in Cambridge, I put out a warm welcome. It's a little chilly out there. We've got a little bit of snow. I wasn't expecting, but uh, we're getting closer to spring. So we look forward uh, to spring coming. We welcome everyone who has gathered here in our sanctuary, as well as our friends online on Facebook and YouTube. Um, a thank you to Andrew for uh, making that possible, it's live streaming uh, to our friends out in the ether world. And, uh, and we thank Marion and the choir uh, for their uh, music, and to Mary, who is advancing the slides this morning, and to our uh, wonderful people who are going to be providing uh, coffee and tea after the service, and everyone is welcome to, to join us afterwards for a time of fellowship. We do have a few announcements, and uh, the first is uh, reminding everyone that today is the last day that we are uh, accepting donations for our campaign raising money for Lazard House, which is the, um, the hospice uh, in here in Cambridge. Um, we have had uh, some people already make donations, but uh, we encourage anyone who is able to uh, either give a check to the church um, or through e-transfer and um, just make a note that your, uh, that your donation is to go to Lazard House. Um, it's a wonderful place. I don't know uh, is, if anyone has, uh, any of you have, have been there, but uh, the atmosphere is um, very supportive and calm and caring. And it, the uh, end of life uh, care that is provided at Lazard House is done so at no cost to the residents and the clients that, that, uh, that spend time there. So it is a, a wonderful uh, ministry in itself in our community. So that is why our outreach, outreach committee um, chose it as, as a campaign for, for fundraising at this time. So we thank you uh, for those who have already donated. And uh, as I say, today is our last day fina uh, finalizing that campaign. This coming Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. is our council meeting. Uh, everyone who uh, normally attends has already received the link. If there is anyone else who would like to attend, our council meetings are, are open to, um, to any of our congregation uh, people. So if you would like to attend, it will be online. Um, you can speak to Rosemary and she can get you the link. Coming up on Good Friday on March 29th, we will be uh, joining with Wesley United and Cedar Hill United for our annual Good Friday service. It will be at Wesley United Church in, uh, in downtown Galt at 10.30 in the morning. So we encourage you to join with us uh, for this uh, important service. And all the choirs uh, join together and it's always a, a very meaningful and uh, uh, service and the music is, is always lovely. So we hope to see you there. At the back table, um, we, uh, we thank Sharon Leamy for providing uh, these little um, Easter booklets uh, from Our Daily Bread. Uh, there are four different ones, as you can see on the screen. Um, and so they're available to take uh, free of charge. I encourage you, they, they have uh, daily readings, and um, especially for this Lenten and Easter season. So please feel free to take as you, uh, as you wish. 
Now, last week, we usually do birthdays on the first week of, uh, of the month, but last week was a busy, busy time with our, our meeting and everything. So today we are going to recognize our March birthday people. And uh, we have Lorraine, Karen, and Doug. Are there any other March birthdays that we are not aware of? Ah. My husband, John. Ah. What day, John? The Ides of March. The Ides of March. That would be the 15th, yes? Sharon? And Michaela. Michaela. And what day is Michaela? The 22nd. The 22nd. All right. Well, well, we'll sing happy birthday and God bless you to all our March birthday people. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. We welcome Michelle Braniff back to our pulpit this morning. And uh, Michelle's been with us for for a long time, <laughs> it's kind of like home here. <laughs> but we uh, we look forward to your leadership this morning, Michelle. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. It, it's always lovely to come here. It uh, feels very much like being at home. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we'll begin with the territorial acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the land of the Haldeman Tract and that we are a treaty people. I'm going to tell you a story, and it's told on a stained glass window of a small Mennonite church very close to this place. In the early days of settlement, the Mennonites had traveled from Pennsylvania across hills and swamps on corduroy roads in wagons to settle on the Haldeman Tract. So at that time, the early days, the land was not yet legally transferred, and the arrangement between the Six Nations and the settlers was a, a yearly rent paid in crops at harvest time. In one summer, there had been a drought, and the crops were very meager. The settler arrived not with the many wagons that would have been expected and agreed on, but one wagon, and very sparse, sparsely loaded, not nearly sufficient for the yearly stipend, but they hoped that it would be accepted as a partial payment. On arrival, the elders greeted the settlers, welcomed them, and then commented on the meager wagon load. And so the settlers explained. And the elders responded, we know about the drought and the poor harvest because we have experienced the same. But if you give the wagon load to us, how will you feed your people? And the settlers said they didn't know, but had faith that all would be well. The Six Nations elders sent the wagon back home without unloading it. Feed your families and the children this winter, and we'll make arrangements for payment in the future. In the times between those early days and the Truth and Reconciliation Report, this story was almost lost. And it's really important to remember stories like this. It's a story about the land and about the relationship between indigenous and settler people on this land. It's a story of peace and it's a story who sh that shows how that dish with one spoon treaty has been interpreted by the indigenous people on the Halden track. So I wanted to share that with you this Sunday. We will do the lighting of the Christ candle. As we light the Christ candle, we honor the tradition of our territory and our obligation as treaty people and as children of God to share responsibility for feeding and healing of the planet and the people, to be allies for ecosystems and for peace. Thank you. The call to worship hopefully is familiar to you. It's inspired by Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. In the time of Exodus, the people followed Moses. They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Israel to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. 
There is no water, and we detest this miserable food. The next part of the journey is about venomous snakes who bit the people, and many Israelites died. came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. God said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Amen. Let's sing together. Voices United 112, O oh God, how we have wandered. And the words will be on the screen. It seems, on this fourth Sunday of Lent, our wilderness journey takes us to a time of complaints and a crisis in leadership. And then snakes. snakes seem to be an essential part of the wilderness stories in biblical times. The wilderness is described in Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and in Isaiah as a place full of venomous snakes. There is also the serpent who tempts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In this story, a bronze snake on a pole has healing power. The Nehushtan is the name of the staff of Moses with the bronze snake wrapped around it. Staff with the bronze snake around it has become the symbol of modern medicine. The symbol of the snake on the pole was a symbol of healing throughout the Near East, the Mediterranean, and in ancient Greece. We pray for healing and a quick and uneventful journey through the wilderness times of our lives. Amen. Now is the time that we look to the people around us. We nod or smile, wave, nudge. Uh, rub elbows. Now is the time to share the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Thank you for joining us, folks. Peace be with you. Thank you. See you again next week.
God bless. The next hymn is um, Voices United 574, Come Let Us Sing of a Wonderful Love, and the words will be on the screen. May God's light shine upon us to bless my voice as I read the gospel and to bless our hearts and minds as we contemplate the words of scripture. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the third chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at the 14th verse. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Just as Moses lifted up the snakes in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by truth comes into the light so that it may be, be seen plainly 
that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Here ends our reading. Ancient words ever true, changing me, changing you. We have come with open hearts. Let the ancient words impart. To think. And it's good to think about this on this time between winter and spring. What is the difference between a garden and a wilderness? A path. A garden has a path. This was very poignant to me the year that I uh, discovered that my raspberries that began with one plant had grown so thick, and of course raspberries have thorn, so, so close and dense that in order to get to the back of the house, you couldn't go around that side anymore. You had to go the other side. There was no, there was no path. And maybe that's an explanation about why it took 40 years, the exodus. The distance between the places even walking is not a 40 year walk. There was no path. There was no one that we hear of that they could ask directions, no caravan to join. Now my father always has says that until you stop and ask for directions, you're not really lost. But there was no path. And I think about canoe portages that I have done in Killarney or Algonquin parks. There were maps. The trails were marked. There was a way to be guided. And a protocol in case you didn't come out. And if you think about it that way, these wilderness trips are a wilderness experience in a managed park, more like a garden than a wilderness. The story of the Bible begins at the Garden of Eden. And somewhere in the middle is the exodus, the trip through the wilderness. And the parts that we visited today in the call to worship and the opening prayer, they are the times in the exodus on that journey when there was a crisis of leadership. And maybe the grumbling was quiet and in the background, and maybe it was said with what was intended to be humor, but came out very sarcastic. Maybe the comment that God sent the snakes was a humorous attempt to capture the crisis of leadership. Even God is sending snakes to us. Or maybe it's, it's a theological explanation. Maybe the snakes were already there and they were just not prepared for snakes. I had a cousin who visited Alberta in the summertime and when she came back, uh, she came back with cowboy boots. And her explanation was, well, the reason you wear cowboy boots in Alberta is because of the rattlesnakes. They're way better than sandals. So the people were not prepared. There was a crisis in leadership. There were venomous snakes. No matter whether you speak metaphorically or about the relationships, about the society, or about the place where they were, it was a toxic time. People came to Moses and asked for leadership. He turned to him and he prayed. And maybe you can explain this with science or a literal explanation, or maybe you just let it be a mystery. But the answer to that prayer was the Nehushtan, the bronze snake on the pole. And maybe you could explain this with, with positive thinking, or the laying on of hands or healing energy, or, or that the, the, the Nehushtan marked a place where there was a snake bite kit. However we decide to explain it or understand it, what is really clear is this is all about healing. Even today, 
That bronze snake on the pole is a symbol of modern medicine, of healing. So here we are, fourth Sunday of Lent, and the question is, what is healing when we are lost in the wilderness? Lent is a wilderness time. It's between Christmas and Good Friday, Easter weekend. When I was in seminary, they talked about liminal times, between times. The examples were the moments immediately put before, during, and after birth. And death, liminal times. Adolescence, not a child, not an adult, liminal times. The period of time when a marriage is over, but the partners have not decided that they will separate. The time between a test and the results, whether it's an academic or a medical test, liminal times. Alzheimer's, they call it the long goodbye. And today, and the time between standard and daylight savings, when you wake up and some of the clocks have one time and others have another, and outside it's not as dark as you think it should be, or maybe more dark, and your biological, liminal times, in between times, a time of confusion, a time of, 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 of uh, not having a path. And so in Lent, we practice. And, and maybe we practice sacrifice to be ready for times of loss and grief. Maybe we develop a practice, meditation, prayer, so that we're ready for the liminal times in our life, ready for the wilderness times. Liminal times are holy times. Think of the temple where there's the outer court and the space in between and then the holy of holies where only the high priests go, the liminal space. We saw a sign by a church on Friday. It said, if you give up chocolate for Lent without prayer, it's just a diet. Yeah. <laughs> so the holiness of liminal times. The gospel reading today is from John with an image of healing that, that, that comes from the Exodus. Now, if you think of the gospel writers, Mark is the most simple, and, and, and Luke and Matthew are storytellers. John is poetic, evangelical. Its commentary is very much in the context of the time that he wrote, about 100 years after the de death of Jesus. It was a time when Christianity was a newly beginning sect among many, many Judaic sects. It, it, it was like an adolescent child or a younger brother. And so some of the comments that John makes are within a family understood in one way, but of course, as Christianity became more and more powerful and privileged, those remarks have led to anti-Semitism. Anti but at the time, they're within the family. And in those times, Forgiveness of sins in the Jewish faith at that time was mostly about sacrifices of animals. That's why, why doves and other, other small animals were for sale in the temple. Other religions also had the sacrifice, the, the, the blood sacrifices of, of animals. The Jewish faith has developed with a different idea of atonement, but you can see in the context of the time that John wrote why he would look and explain the crucifixion as a sacrifice. It made sense in the time that he was writing. John Calvin built on that. He said, Jesus died for our sins so that we may be atoned. And then there's the satirical, satirical or sarcastic interpretation of Calvin. If Jesus died for our sins, we should sin as much as possible so he didn't die for nothing. Maybe humor or lack of humor, maybe the kind of grumbling that happened in the Exodus during a failure of leadership. 
I'm going to let Good Friday be Good Friday, however you believe in it. But let's talk today on the fourth Sunday of Lent about Jesus' life. Family member at a funeral after a tragic, violent death said, I want people to remember her life, not her death. And I'm going to suggest to you that in Lent especially, it's a time to remember the life of Jesus. Sometimes that symbol of Jesus' death becomes a symbol of, of our faith. Today, let's talk about the life of Jesus. And Jesus was all about healing. Individuals, stories of reconciliation, of redemption, teaching that reminded people about the prophets, upturning of tables in the temple, rehabilitation, back to the faith of Isaiah and the prophets. He offered radical hospitality with wine, bread, fishes, talked to the woman at the well, ate with tax collectors and sinners. In modern times, think of holistic healing, healing of the body, the mind, the soul. Radical hospitality to change social systems, to welcome, feed, clothe the hungry, look after the widow, the orphan, provide conditions for the marginalized that are a testament to how loving and kind our society can be. We have lots of upward room for improvement in our society. Lots. Lent, liminal times. No path in the wilderness. And maybe you already have a Lenten practice. Or maybe you started one and maybe it's time to start again. Or maybe you have ideas. Ideas for healing, for yourself, for your family, your relationships, your neighborhood, the community, the planet. There's still time to practice on this journey. And make no mistake, Jesus was political. Jesus was a threat to the status quo, and that is why he was crucified. In historical times, the powerful leaders of the temple saw him as a threat. So Jesus' life is a story of courage because he knew, he knew that hanging on to his values was dangerous. He knew the risks and showed us a practice. And, and maybe for us in Lent, it will be a practice of social justice, maybe a practice of curiosity and learning, maybe a practice of kindness every day, of radical hospitality in the community as a volunteer, maybe meditation, self-care, reflection. I started a practice of using an art journal to reflect and to remind me to be kind. The Lent is a call to leave Egypt, leave that, that, that comfortable, uh, materialistic society, a time to find a new path to heal and be healed. May it be so.
And the offertory music is Grant Us God the Grace. I think that's the offertory music. Am I right? Grant Us God the Grace. Yes, yes. <laughs> God, our creator, through your love, you have given us these gifts to share. Bless our offerings. Like Jesus' miracles of healings, we too are called to offer healing and radical hospitality to those we meet. We give these gifts as we live our lives, knowing that we are not in complete control and willing to surrender and trust God and our community through the grace and love of God. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, in these times of war, violence, and polarized politics, we pray for a new beginning, a renaissance of healing, kindness, peace, and love. God of peace, we pray for Gaza, for Palestine, for Israel, and we pray for a path to negotiating ceasefire now and a lasting rec reconciliation in these lands that are both historically and metaphorically liminal places, holy and hallowed, but literally torn apart by violence. And we pray for peace for the, the Ukraine and ha Haiti and other parts of the world torn by violence. God of hope, we pray for healing. For those whose names are printed on the screen, and those written in our hearts. We pray for healing of our families, our neighborhoods, and for the earth. We pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Closing hymn is Amazing Grace. It's one of my favorites, and you probably all know the story that it was uh, written by a man who had been very involved in the slave trade. And so it's a story of, of redemption and love and new beginnings.
As we leave this place, may we go with God's grace and love in our hearts so that as we face these between times, not winter but not yet spring, that God, the Creator, will guide us to sacred times. And may we follow the example of Jesus, healing and radical hospitality. And always may the Spirit of God be in our hearts so that we do with what we know is right, even when it's the most difficult thing that can be. Let us go now in the love and grace of God. Amen. <laughs>